waiting for Godot. Uncertainty and suffering in 12 minutes, possibly. What are we doing here? That is the question. And we are blessed in this, that we happen to know the answer. Yes, in this immense confusion, one thing alone is clear. We are waiting for Godot to come. In probably the 20th century's defining play, Beckett redraws our spiritual, psychological and emotional landscape into a wasteland that's bleak, barren and occasionally very funny, wherein the destitution of modern man acquires its elevation. If you've ever wondered what all the fuss is about, here's an introduction to uncertainty and suffering in waiting for Godot. Nothing happens. Nobody comes. Nobody goes. It's awful, claims Estragon in a moment of metatheatre and the cryptic John Anuil in his review. However, Anuil went on to write this was the most important premiere to be staged in Paris for 40 years. To understand his claim, we need to understand how Godot redraws the literary model of life. We're going to look at how it recasts suffering and uncertainty. In a standard view of model, or in a standard view or model of life, and literature for that matter, suffering is built into the heart of the human experience. The first noble truth of Buddhism, for example, states, suffering, pain and misery exist in human life. It then goes on to list some examples. <laughs> this is not an exhaustive list, by the way. Of the 929 chapters in the Old Testament, Adam and Eve manage a meagre two in paradise before God gives them their marching orders with suffering and sorrow on the menu. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So that's 927 chapters of suffering to come. And all of the New Testament's 260 chapters are predicated on Christ's suffering and the exhortation for his disciples to follow suit. Even if you're not of a religious persuasion, most thinkers consider the act of being self-conscious necessitates suffering. Self-consciousness reveals to us our weaknesses, our inadequacies, our uncertainties. It splits us from the rest of existence, causing separation and isolation. So I think it's fair to say it's generally accepted that suffering is part and parcel, fundamental even, to being human. So how does Godot change any of this? Well, it certainly doesn't neglect the notion of suffering, that's for sure. This play is not called Waiting for Godot whilst hanging out in paradise with my friend. No. Pain and suffering are at the core of each character's experience. Estrogen's feet hurt. His left lung is weak. Vladimir has an unnamed urinary tract infection. Lucky has a running sore or goiter. Pozzo goes blind. Lucky goes dumb. Estrogen gets beaten. The boy's brother is beaten. They're hungry. And then there's the mental and emotional torment of anxiety, doubt, loneliness, rejection, fear and nightmares. Whatever model of existence Beckett is portraying, it is not without suffering. In fact, the character's whole life is rife with physical, emotional and intellectual torment without respite. So what's different? Well, the answer is found in the cause and purpose of suffering. In the noble truths, Buddha taught we cause our own suffering through our attachments and desire. He also spoke about the possibility of the cessation of suffering. Nirvana awaits those noble souls who liberate themselves from attachment. Now that is not on the cards for Beckett's characters. Pozzo and Lucky are physically tied together. Vladimir and Estrion are tied to their appointment with Godot. Beckett is going out of his way to point out how attached we are to our attachments, even when they bring us pain, like Lucky's running sore, or seem futile. In this immense confusion, one thing alone is clear. We are waiting for Godot to come. He is such a wag. Furthermore, suffering in the Old Testament 
is not necessarily a punishment. God states, and here comes my godly voice, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. For thy sake suggests it could be a blessing. It's for our own good that we suffer. Our suffering has meaning. It's a redemptive quality to it. This idea is picked up in the New Testament. St. Paul writes to the Corinthians, When we are made to suffer, it's for our consolation, our and salvation. And this motif is fundamental to many literary texts. Suffering is part of the transformational process of the hero's journey. The protagonists face challenges and in doing so they overcome their weaknesses and fears and are transformed into a better version of themselves. Now before you dismiss this as a fanciful notion of fiction, consider the whole of the psychotherapeutic industry of counselling, of coaching and education is based on the concept of overcoming our limits, overcoming our fears. It's a central tenet of modern thinking. It is that we can change, we can grow and we can overcome. To that extent, we are all Nietzsche's babies. Nice tash, Fred. Except for Beckett, of course. His characters don't grow don't change and don't overcome. They age, they atrophy, they suffer, but their suffering has no meaning, no certain cause and no transformational quality. Vladimir and Estrogen are standing on a road, which could be a nod to the point, uh, to, to the idea of transformation or journey, but they don't travel down it. The point Beckett seems to be making about the world and, well, so what is the point Beckett seems to be making about the world and humanity? Let's take a look at a little bit more detail how characters suffer in Godot. Estragon's feet hurt, but he can't find the cause. He pulls off his boot. He peers inside it. He feels about inside it, turns it upside down, shakes it, looks on the ground to see if anything has fallen out. Finds nothing, feels inside again, staring sightlessly before him staring sightlessly. He sees, but he does not see the cause of his suffering. And just as Vladimir makes the acute observation, there's man all over for you, blaming on his boots the fault of his feet, he too does the same thing with his hat. He takes off his hat again, peers inside it, feels about inside it, knocks on the crown, blows into it, puts it on again. These characters are constantly irritated, aggravated, annoyed. They seek the cause of their suffering, but can't find it. Estragon claims, my left lung is very weak. But there's no further explanation, no accurate diagnosis, no known cause, no remedy, and no redemptive qualities. Vladimir has an unnamed urinary tract infection. He breaks into a hearty laugh, which he immediately stifles, his hand pressed to his pubis, his face contorted. Again, no accurate diagnosis, no known cause, no remedy, and no redemptive qualities. This model of uncertainty spreads out like bad news across the whole play. Violence follows the same suit. Estragon is beaten in Act 1 and Act 2, but by whom? And for what reason? We don't know. Violence with the boy follows the same pattern. Godot beats his brother, but no reason or purpose is ever given. Beckett is pointing out, of course, you are going to suffer, that's certain, but there will be no rhyme, no reason, and no redemption to it. Remark, says Pozzo, that I might just as well have been in his shoes and he in mine, if chance had not willed otherwise. Unlike the Buddhist doctrine, we are not the cause of our suffering, and unlike the Christian doctrine, it has no meaning, no redemptive qualities, and no remedy. In the world of waiting for Godot, chance is king. Because that's how it is on this bitch of an earth. Beckett takes this idea of chance or uncertainty and applies it liberally. In an amusing exchange riddled with ambiguity on the two thieves crucified with Christ, Vladimir observed all four evangelists were there, 
but only one speaks of a thief being saved. Two don't mention any thieves at all, and the third says that both of them abused him because he wouldn't save them. According to this exchange, a crucial moment in the doctrine of salvation lacks consistency. Once again, we can't be certain who, if any of them, is telling the truth. Language poses the same problem. It is inherently ambiguous. Beckett, of course, is not the first writer to point this out. The plot, for what it's worth, hangs on the characters waiting in the right place for Godot to arrive. Vladimir. He said, by the tree. Do you see any others? Looks more like a bush. A shrub? What are you insinuating? That we've come to the wrong place? The point being, language cannot be relied upon to correctly mo map, model, or describe reality. And so it goes on. <laughs> In relentless fashion, carrots are mistaken for turnips. Boots could be black, grey, green, or even brown. This play defines man as a pathetic character suffering in a world that is unknown and unknowable. Sound familiar? It's considered great because it challenges the models that have gone before. Whilst it shares the notion that human suffering is inevitable, unlike Christianity or Judaism, suffering has no meaning. It's not redemptive, and unlike Buddhism, we are not the cause. Suffering is just part of the fabric of existence which seems to run on chance. This place suggests reality is unknowable. It doesn't have an intrinsically logical structure that rationalists would have us believe, and it's not mapped accurately by language. Whether God will or will not turn up in the end remains to be seen. All his characters can do is pass the time whilst waiting. That was an introduction to uncertainty and suffering in waiting for Godot, and this is Think, Think, Inc. Thanking you.